Welcome to the Rochester, New Hampshire History Podcast, a monthly show that will shine a light on a piece of history that has been all but forgotten. Hurricane Carol was one of the deadliest hurricanes to hit the Northeast. Its powerful winds wall up New England, causing death, destruction, and power outages. Conditions were so bad in Rhode Island that martial law was declared. The hurricane killed 65 and injured over 1,000. In addition, more than 10,000 homes were damaged, including 1,600 that were completely destroyed. Another 3,000 boats and 3,500 cars were wrecked. Hurricane Carol started August 25, 1954, as a tropical wave near the Bahamas. It grew stronger as it moved toward the eastern coast of the United States. On August 27, Carol's winds were up to 105 miles an hour, and on August 31st, Carol made landfall in Connecticut. It then tore into northern New England, bringing with it a swath of destruction. Unlike today, where we would have had several days of warning of the impending hurricane, Rochester only had several hours' notice before the storm would strike. Within those few hours, businesses let their employees go home and everyone hunkered down. Shortly after 12 on Tuesday, August 31st, the hurricane struck and rocked the city for six hours. Almost four inches of rain fell in the short amount of time. Around six in the evening, the storm had moved on, leaving the city's roads and streets a tangled mess of trees, utility poles, wires, debris, and even a few cars were flipped over. It was impossible to drive through the cluttered streets. If you were to step outside that night, perhaps you would have heard the buzz of a chainsaw, but mostly there was silence. Even though the storm's punishing winds were in excess of 90 miles an hour, there was no loss of life in the city. However, the storm destroyed thousands of trees in Stratford County. One of the reasons for the great loss of trees was a persistent three-year drought that weakened the tree root system. The eye of the hurricane passed over Rochester, thus the city suffered more damage than some of the surrounding communities. It is estimated the damage for Stratford County was over half a million dollars. Most everyone had lost power and were using candles for light. Fortunate were the families who still cooked with wood or coal since the power would not be restored for several days. After the storm had left the area, news reports slowly trickled in of the destruction wrought by the storm. Almost all the Rochester Main Street stores, such as F. W. Woolworths, Ayers and Jenkins, Rollins Boot Shop, and Herbie's Restaurant, suffered broken windows. The shattered glass lit in Main Street, and the wind scattered the store's displays throughout the stores and into the streets. Ralph Canney, the owner of the Hens Nest Poultry Farm, suffered a shoulder injury as a huge barn door was ripped off the building and pinned him to the ground. The strong winds proceeded to flatten two of his poultry houses, each of them 200 feet in length. Another one of his buildings had its roof ripped off. At the New England Brick Company, powerful winds ripped through their buildings, tearing off catwalks, ripping the roof from the making room, and throwing panels over a wide area. The hurricane moved the roof's main building about a foot. Champlin Lumber Company on Glenwood Ave suffered thousands of dollars of damage. The wild winds ripped the roof off of the storage shed and hurled it onto the roof of the kiln, putting both buildings out of commission. In addition, the building's boiler room was also put out of commission. It would be several days before the lumber company was operating at full capacity. The National Guard Armory in Gonic was damaged when the wind lifted its roof and, and dropped it back down, which demolished a brick wall. On Portland Street, a pitch-foot section of a greenhouse owned by Studley Greenhouses was utterly demolished when it caved in from the force of the winds. Also, four utility poles located on the property were snapped in two. On St. Falls Road, a hundred-year-old elm tree was twisted off the lawn of A.R. Chalmers and crushed Mr. Chalmers' roof. The accompanying rains did additional damage to the inside of the house. Surprisingly, only one Rochester school was heavily damaged when the roof was blown off the Maple Street School, which led to considerable water damage to the paint and plaster. One of the dugouts in the press box the Spalding High School baseball field were also destroyed. In East Rochester, the storm was particularly fierce. A house on the corner of Green and Main Street, occupied by Mrs. Iris Newt and Mrs. Ernestine Key, was heavily damaged when a large tree collapsed into their dwelling and destroyed half of the house. On Grove Street, a barn owned by Bertram Power was blown off its foundation. On Warren Street, a huge tree was uprooted and landed on the roof of a tenement, damaging the ceilings of the building. Another house on Warren Street, owned by William Bowers, were also struck by a tree, damaging the roof and breaking windows. Immediately after the storm had left the area, the entire Public Works Department started clearing debris. Seven chainsaw crews, three bulldozers, and approximately 60 men worked day and night. A 50-ton crane brought in by the telephone company helped lift trees off houses. 
By Thursday, all main roadways were open for traffic. That was just the beginning. The damage was so extensive, the cleanup work would continue for months. It was not until December that the cleanup was finally finished. The biggest casualty of the hurricanes were the hundreds, maybe thousands of trees the city lost. The houses were repaired, the utility poles were replaced, new TV antennas took the place of the hundreds of mangled TV antennas. However, you couldn't replace a tree that was 100 years old or older. Imagine the large trees we'd have today if the hurricane did not ravage the city in 1954. This ends the podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email bobgriffinpodcast at gmail.com and come back next month for another episode of Rochester, New Hampshire History.